Good afternoon. Welcome to Northwood Presbyterian Church for our Lenten cantata. I'm delighted to see all you here this evening as we continue our journey through Holy Week. Let us begin uh, this concert with prayer. Let us pray. We give you thanks, great God, for the hope, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and for the message this afternoon of this wonderful cantata. O oh Lord, we praise you because of Christ's presence with us. Help us to know through the message of this cantata and through our time together this afternoon that because Christ lives, we look forward to eternal life, knowing that nothing past, present, or yet to come can separate us from your great love made known in Jesus Christ. We celebrate that love today. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. 
Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. He brought a dead man back to life? You saw this yourself? I did. He had been dead for three days, three whole days in the sealed tomb. Then this Jesus comes. He was friends with the man's sisters, too. He comes and tells them to open the tomb. They looked at him like he was crazy. We all did. But they opened the tomb, and he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he did. He walked out of the tomb alive as you or me. Seems that not even the grave could contain the power that Jesus brought with him. The crowd was a buzz with stories about this man they would heard was coming to Jerusalem that day. Those who had seen him before and many of those who had witnessed the miracles that happened at his hand were drawn out into the streets to welcome him. And they told their neighbors, friends, family. The streets were lined with swells of souls that wanted to catch a glimpse of this Jesus, this king. I heard he was destined to become our king. Surely he will ride on magnificent steed, sword by his side, army behind him. He will save us from the oppressing hand of Rome that is crushing us. He will be our... A prophet. He's just a prophet like Elijah or Daniel or one of the others. He's bring, here to bring us some divine news. He's here to bring us a message from God. He is... A man. Just a man. Flesh and bone and a whole lot of fanfare over nothing. In fact, I heard he's a Nazarene. Huh. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But I know to the religious leaders, he is... A threat. A very real, very dangerous threat. A threat that must finally be answered, and soon. The news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem continued to sweep through the city, and a large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down to the road to meet him. They cheered him, saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Most of the crowd spreads their branches and garments on the road with, uh, ahead of him, and Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Hail to the King of Israel! Praise God for the Son of David! And Jesus didn't come on horseback like a conquering king. He rode humbly on the back of a donkey's colt. And he didn't come in an opulent chariot brandishing a gilded sword. He came with clothes on his back and dust on his feet. And behind him, not an army marching in rows by the thousands. He was trailed by a ragamuffin group of fishermen and the poor, the outcasts, the nobodies. Some laid down their branches to praise their king. Some laid down their palms to praise their Lord. Soon he would lay down his life for all of them.
repose about him on his left on his right their feet engrossed in the same muck and mire caked upon his why wouldn't they be they've walked the same streets trod the same paths they have followed their rabbi and the dust off his heels has covered their bodies telling of where they've been where he has led them the dirt tells the story of the life God incarnate firsthand instructed them inspired them to live by living it first. Their rabbi stands in the middle of their simple meal, in the middle of their peaceful repose, he stands. The disciples have grown to know their rabbi is un abrupt and forthright, unusual even at times, and once again, they're about to witness something that is great, yet something so small. Removing his outer robes, their rabbi exchanges them for a towel, tying it around his waist. His hands reach with designed purpose for a large bowl and a pitcher of water. With resolve, he moves back to the table where these 12 men now sit silently watching him, wondering at him. He never ceases to amaze them, well, most of them. And dropping to his knees, he sits at the feet of Andrew. He reaches out and, without a word, takes up his foot up in his hands and begins washing Andrew's feet. Andrew is frozen by his own confusion. His rabbi looks up at him, smiles. Andrew's attention is lessened by his friend's reassuring face. Turning his head to the eyes he knows are watching him, Andrew communicates his confusion back to his fellow disciples with the same face they convey to him, looking down at his feet they're clean, but his rabbi's not finished. One by one, Jesus moves among his disciples, James and Philip, Bartholomew, followed by James, son of Alphaeus, and Thomas. He moves to Matthew, Thaddeus, John, and Simon the Zealot. At, 
all sat in astonishment, all sat in disbelief for one reason or another. Peter's hands tighten with grip. His rabbi was just picking up the basin from Thomas's now clean feet, and Peter knew he was sitting next to Thomas. Looking down at his feet, Peter saw them for what they were. They were revolting. Even to his own eyes, he knew those, where those feet had been, places known to be dirty, dingy, disgusting, highly undesirable places to travel. The evidence was on his feet. His feet were a portrait of the paths he had wandered, good and bad. Peter was roused from his silent reverie by the sudden touch of his rabbi's hand on his foot. No. Peter shouted. Startled from his seat, Peter stepped away from where the rabbi sat on the ground before him. No. He spoke again with less brashness and more control as he had learned over these past three years. And he added, You will never wash my feet. Never. I am not worthy of you. You washing my feet? I should be washing your feet. I should be licking the dirt off your souls. No, Lord, you will never wash my feet. The room fell into an even more silent silence. Their rabbi stood, and looking his frazzled friend in the face, he said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will. Jesus motioned for Peter to sit back down so he could continue but Peter was still unconvinced, still resolved to remain untouched by the Savior. Then Jesus said, If I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. With that, Peter fell to the ground, head bowed in submission, exclaiming, Then not only my feet, Lord, but my hands and my head too. Jesus smiled as he embraced the new spirit in his friend. The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. And Jesus went back on his knees, took up the cloth, poured on the water, and wiped away the dust and the dirt, the muck and the mire from the feet of his friend. Not every one of you? The ominous phrase rang in every ear. And there was one man left. One pair of dirty feet still in need of washing. At the end of the row sat one purposefully distanced himself from the head of the table. He purposefully abandoned a closer seat. But the basin still in hand and his feet still in reach of Jesus did it as he would do with any man in desperate need. And taking up the floor at Judas' feet, the Lord washed with equal if not great care, those feet that were in a moment, he knew, itching to further stray. Those feet, in a moment, would run away and betray him. Sweat on his brow, he returned the bowl and towel, and dressing, resumed his place. And he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord, your teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You've given us an example of what we should do as you have done for us. Do as you have done. Live as you have lived. Jesus told his disciples 
Jesus led his disciples through the darkness up a narrow path on the Mount of Olives to a garden called Gethsemane. As they reached the spot, Jesus turned to them and said, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He asked Peter, James, and John to go a little further with him. They could see a sort of sadness and trouble written in the furrowed brow of the rabbi, and then he turned to them and said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here. Keep watch with me. They stayed where Jesus had told them to stay. They watched him as he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away into the garden until he was just out of sight. How long would he be? Jesus often prayed alone and for a long time with his father. So they sat down and rested from the walk, wearied by their own sorrow. Jesus fell with his face to the ground. With his face to the ground, he prayed most earnestly, My father, if it is possible, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. In anguish, he prayed with sweat like drops of blood to the ground. The cup was bitter. Jesus prayed for that dreadful cup to be taken away. He prayed that if it were possible, the lamb didn't have to be slain. Rising, Jesus returned to where he had asked his disciples to remain vigilant with him, and he found them dead asleep. Could you watch with me for one hour? He asked them again. Watch, pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, after entreating them once more, he went back to pray, saying, Abba, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken unless I drink it, May your will be done. May your will be done. And coming to his feet again, he returned to his disciples. Would they be alert for him, praying for him, standing guard for them, for him, their friend? Sound asleep again. Unable or unwilling to stay awake. Perhaps they don't understand what's at stake. Jesus pleads with his friends again to keep watch with him to the end. Once more, he goes off to pray. And once more, down they lay.
time for keeping watch has come to an end because in the distance, a soft glow of light approaching quickly. The still silent garden now begins to rumble with the sound of a fast approaching angry mob. The disciples are awake now, and in an instant, they're staring back at what feels like a legion of armed men waving swords and clubs in front of their hate-filled eyes. Sent by the chief priests, the teachers of the laws, and the elders, the mob white knuckle grips their weapons, ready themselves to pounce on the one they've come to arrest. A lone man steps out from the mob and moves slowly and methodically toward the place where Jesus is now standing. The disciples don't make a move. Why would they? This man is no threat to their Lord. This man is one of their own. Or so they thought. The man steps in front of Jesus and leaning in close to him says, Rabbi. And kissing him on the cheek, he steps back, catching for a moment the swelling sorrow written in the eyes of the one he just betrayed. The mob erupts, lunging forward at this signal from Judas. They move to bind Jesus and start to drag him away. But Peter, taking up his sword, swiping at one of the mob, threatening his rabbi, lopping off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? And reaching out, Jesus touched the man's ear as quickly as he was wounded, he was healed. They dragged Jesus away, bound and chained. The cup was poured and ready for the drinking. And speaking to the crowd, and an evil unseen, Jesus said, This is your hour when darkness reigns. And with that, his disciples ran away, deserting him. Yeah. 
the crowd that shouted, Hosanna, just a few days before, spreading their cloaks off their backs to honor him, breaking palms off the trees and prostrating them at his holy feet. Crucify him! Demanding the breaking of his body tomorrow. See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. They resolutely require the laying down of the law upon his innocent head. He threatens our way of life, our position, our pride. The little baby has left the manger to live life like the life he gave us and restore the life we left in Eden. Our God incarnate, king of creation, proven power over death. Power over death? They say he raised Lazarus from the dead? Then he walked right out of the tomb? Well, let's see how this Jesus fares when it's his body in the grave, his body in the tomb. Hosanna! 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 Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord!
sundown, the high priests and Pharisees arranged a meeting with Pilate. They said, Sir, we just remembered that the liar announced while he was still alive, after three days I will be raised. We've got to get that tomb sealed until the third day. There's a good chance his disciples will come and steal the corpse and then go around saying, he's risen from the dead. Then we'll be worse off than before, the final deceit surpassing the first. Pilate told them, I will let you have a guard. Go ahead and secure it the best way you can. So they went out and secured the tomb, sealing the, with the stone and posting guards. After the Sabbath, as the first light of the new week dawned, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. Suddenly the earth reeled and rocked under their feet as God's angel came down from heaven, came right up to where they were standing. He rolled back the stone and sat on it. Shafts of lightning blazed from him. His garments shimmered snow white. The guards at the tomb were scared to death. They were so frightened they couldn't move. The angel spoke to the women. <coughs> There's nothing to fear here. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. He's not here. He was raised just as he said. Come and look at the place where he was placed. Now get on your way quickly and tell his disciples. He's risen from the dead. He's going on ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. That is the message. Thank you. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Stephanie, and the choir, and the musicians, and the drummist, uh, to truly give us a sense of praise and wonder as we prepare for Holy Week and for the journey that we take with Jesus to the cross and then the celebration of the resurrection. Let us offer a word of prayer. Our gracious Lord, we are indeed mindful of your mercy and your grace as we've gathered here in this uh, house of prayer to worship you and to indeed have our spirits lifted up high with the gift of music that's been shared, with your word that's been proclaimed, and with the drama that has given it a powerful impact. Lord, may our hearts be open to the grace and you speaking to us through this upcoming week. And Lord, may our time together certainly open us up even further to the good news of the gospel. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 